right, welcome to another broadcast of the North Carolina Masonic Research Society. Tonight we are ecstatic to have Worshipful Brother Don McAndrews with us. Uh, Worshipful Brother Don wants to give us a presentation, is going to give us a presentation on uh, the work of Irish author Tim Wallace Murphy uh, called The Knights of the Holy Grail and the Secret History of the Knights Templar. Uh, Don is a past Grand High Priest of Virginia, uh, past illustrious Grand Master of the Cryptic Masons in the District of Columbia, that's both York Wright bodies, past District Deputy Grand Master, past, uh, was that Grand Bung of the Americas? No, I'm still the current Grand Bung of the Americas. Grand Bung of the Americas, I like that. Order of the Court, great, and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. But uh, Don, we are thrilled to have you tonight and really looking forward to this. So uh, with no further ado, I think Tim is waving at us. Tim. Sorry, Matt, I couldn't get the text to go through. Um, the saying we're having trouble playing this video on the live stream. Uh -oh. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's, it's playing fine on my end, so. Yeah, it's up, man. Yeah. I, I, I think we're good. Maybe Facebook's just being temperamental. I can't see it. You know, that's live TV. <laughs> so, Worshipful Brother Don, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours, sir. All right. I want to tell you a little story, though, before I get into this, uh, about how I came to uh, find out about Tim Wallace Murphy. Uh, I go over to Ireland every year, sometimes twice in a year, and uh, a good friend of mine over there, uh, was actually a, a friend of Tim Wallace Murphy. He had lived uh, most of his life in Ireland, uh, but he had uh, ended up in his later years moving to France, and uh, that's where he died not too many years ago. If you are interested in the things that I'm going to tell you about him, uh, you can actually go to YouTube and just search on YouTube for Tim Wallace Murphy. And uh, he actually has given lectures, and many of his lectures are posted on YouTube. Now, ancient Egypt had a sustained system of initiation preserved through a hereditary priesthood documented in the pyramid texts. Egyptian science, medicine, mathematics, astronomy were of an exponentially higher order of refinement and sophistication than many modern scholars will admit. The high level of gnosis which came through initiation was not used for personal gain, but, uh, uh, but by the priestly and royal initiates. Although their rank entitled them to the privilege they used their sacred knowledge of astronomy, agriculture, architecture, building, medicine, mathematics, metallurgy, and navigation for the benefit of the entire community. After uh, the Exodus, this initiatory tradition continued in the emerging Judaism. Uh, in fact, uh, there's another English author uh, who, Ralph Ellis, to uh, uh, you can get some lectures of Ralph Ellis on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, Ralph Ellis uh, uh, basically conjectures that Moses was a uh, high priest in Egypt and that his brother, uh, Akhenaten, was actually uh, Aaron. Uh, Akhenaten was the uh, uh, the the uh, pharaoh of Lower Egypt. Uh, very, very interesting. They've never found the body of Akhenaten. And uh, Ralph Ellis says uh, the reason is uh, he's not buried down there in Egypt. So uh, he was part of the Exodus. So very interesting stuff from Ralph Ellis's side. Now, the Egyptians referred to the supreme god of their pantheon as the most high god. And uh, this is the same na name used by Abraham in the mysterious priest and the mysterious priests of uh, Jerusalem, Melchizedek. It is also interesting to note that Abraham adopted for himself and his children the Egyptian custom of circumcision, practiced by Egyptian priests and royalty since 4000 BC. 
the Jewish hereditary priesthood coming from the tribe of Levi is like the Egyptians whose priests were the hereditary caste and were guardians of the sacred knowledge. Mystical speculations in the Jewish Talmud focus on the work of creation described in Genesis and the divine chariot in the account of Ezekiel. These mystical doctrines were carefully guarded and only allowed to be expounded to a, few, a chosen few as in the traditions of ancient Egypt. The Kabbalah was a major Jewish mystical tradition received from Aaron, father of the caste of high priests. A major tenet of the Kabbalah is the idea of Zadok or the righteous one. Ezekiel mentions the righteous one and Noah referred to him as the foundation of the world. Noah himself was referred to as righteous, an embodiment of the world's covenant of peace. The Old Testament began to take form during the Babylonian exile and work continued over several centuries. It wasn't even written down until the Babylonian exile. It has uh, repeated references to the 24 Ma Mado the hereditary priesthood who took turns serving in the temple in Jerusalem. The high priestly families were descended from Aaron and Zadok, the priest who anointed King Solomon. Uh, interesting story if you want to read it in Kings. The pagan Seleucid king Antiochus IV deposed the last Zadokite high priest in 175 BCE and installed his own nominee the son of the deposed high priest, built a rival temple at uh, Leontopolis in Egypt. The other zealous Zedekite high priest of the Mahmado formed their own sect in the wilderness at Qumran, ex uh, observing traditional worship and observing the sick, strict rules of purity and following the Torah under the leadership of one called the Teacher of Righteousness. Josephus wrote of the Essenes, commonly called the, uh, well, the, it was actually called the Essenes, but it was commonly called the Essenes, uh, who were descended from Zadok. They held their goods in common. They lived pure and austere lives, maintained ritualistic purity, taught justice for all people, and believed in the immortality of the soul. Josephus wrote that they were all exceeded other men that addict themselves to virtue and righteousness. The family of Jesus were certainly members of one of the 24 families of the Mahmado because Jesus' brother James the Just was recorded as being high priest in the scriptures. The works of, uh, he was also recorded in the works of Josephus and the writings of some of the early Christian fathers. This explains why the teachings of Jesus were not guarded uh, were not regarded as the foundation of a new religion. The only thing separating Jesus and his followers from other Jews was the fanatical adherence to Jesus' interpretation of the law and their complete devotion to doing the Torah. The priestly and kingly messiahs, John the Baptist and Jesus, who were cousins and members of the Nazarene sect of Essenes, were regarded as the fulfillment, not a contradiction of the Jewish religious thought and belief. His teachings were so pure and bright that other sects such as the Pharisees and Sadducees saw Jesus as a threat to their priestly authority and power. After the crucifixion, James took on the role of the priestly Messiah, which had been previously held by John the Baptist prior to his beheading by Herod Antipas. The apostles, including Paul, acknowledged James as of the lineage of David and officiated after the manner of the ancient priesthood, whereof also he was permitted once a year to enter the Holy of Holies as the law commanded the high priest, according to that which is written, for so many before us have told of him, both Eusebius and Clement and others Furthermore, he was empowered to wear on his head the high priestly diadem, as the aforementioned trustworthy men have mentioned. The preeminence of James is well documented, yet late, later church teachings about him are sparse at best. Oops. And why was he uh, 
why was his role minimized by the church in referring to him as James the Less? The earliest writings about Jesus uh, do not claim his, and I keep losing my video here. The earliest writings about Jesus do not claim his divinity nor claim of Mary to be a virgin. In fact, the uh, Gospel of Mark starts with Jesus' ministry and teaching, completely omitting his birth narrative, which was later added to the other older gospel, gospel or earlier, later gospels. How could Mary be considered ever virgin when Mark's gospel lists his brothers by name and mentions his sisters? Matthew's gospel also lists the names of his brothers. Another brother of Jesus, marginalized by the church, is Didymus Judas Thomas, marginalized with the characterization of doubting Thomas. The gospel written by Thomas was suppressed and disappeared for until almost uh, centuries until it was discovered at Nag Hammadi in 1945. In this gospel, the disciples asked Jesus whom to follow when he departs. His answer is, wherever you are, you are to go to James the righteous for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Some scholars believe that this indicates that James' role as priestly Messiah was superior to that of Jesus, who was the kingly Messiah. Messiah. It is interesting that the Nazarenes, uh, from whom Jesus himself sprang, later called the Ebionites, continued the traditions of the Mahmado and elected their leaders from among the family of Jesus until well into the second century. It was St. Paul, a man who never actually walked with Jesus nor learned at his feet, who first preached the blasphemy that Jesus was divine. Jesus never claimed to be divine. The apostles regarded themselves as an ultra-Orthodox Jewish movement. The idea of a divine human would be so far away from the Jewish concept of God that no Jew could accept that, uh, that belief and would be stoned for blasphemy if he spoke of such an idea. Also, the idea of an innocent man suffering for the sin, sins of others went against fundamental religious principles as stated by Ezekiel. Not to mention that human sacrifice was completely against the law. Yet Paul preached these concepts to the Greeks and Romans to whom a sacrificial death would be familiar and attractive. A document titled the Kerigmata Petro, uh, written in the early years after the crucifixion, describes Paul as the hostile man who falsified the true teachings of Jesus. The Council of Nicaea, which created the Nicene Creed in 325, and it, let me tell you, if you read the history of that, it's not pretty. Uh, it was convened by Constantine, not by the bishops of the church, uh, to end the religious disputes. He didn't really care what the hell the Christians believed. He just wanted them to stop fighting and believe the same thing. This led to the suppression of what the uh, winners of the battle defined as the heresies. Uh, namely, Jesus was a man chosen and empowered by God. Constantine, who was a follower of Mithras, incorporated the Mithraic myths into Christianity, such as the holy birth on December 25th in a grotto attended by shepherds and the idea of the body moving worship uh, away from the Jewish Sabbath to Sunday, as in the cult of Saul Invictus, and the concept of a holy trinity. Constantine imposed sentences of exile on all bishops who refused to sign the council's decrees and all who refused to accept the divinity of Jesus would be excommunicated. It was after Nicaea that the bishops of Rome claimed to be the head of the church. It was a political battle, believe me. The Essenes and the Ebionites, uh, descended of the Mahmado priestly families of ancient Egypt and early Judaism, went underground outwardly following the prevailing religious practices and secretly preserving the true teachings of Jesus. They began to call themselves Rex Deus and continued the strict marriage laws that bound them to marry within their own Kohen or Kohen clans. Once the heretical religions were suppressed, 
the church began to restrict education only to the priests, and the world entered what is referred to as the Dark Ages. The clergy were the only scribes who codified the laws and recorded the histories and oral legends, omitting all that was offensive to doctrine and adding their own religious gloss. Pagan festivals were incorporated into the Christian calendar, such as the festival of Astarte, goddess of love and fertility, which became Easter. The uh, summer solstice became the feast of John the Baptist. The birth of Mithras became Christmas. Because of its remote location from the empire, Celtic Christianity was largely unaffected. Priests were encouraged to marry, and there were no images of the crucifixion in any of their churches. Celtic mystics and monks used an initiatory belief system. Uh, education was treasured, and the monasteries had large and well-used libraries. They evangelized much of Europe, but they were opposed by the, representative, or by the rep repressive attitudes of the corrupt church at Rome. At the end of the 8th century, Pope Leo crowned Charlemagne as the new Holy Roman Emperor. He expanded his empire, creating over 600 uh, counties to be ruled over by his most trusted and newly created counts. The by Charlemagne's death in 814, much of the empire was under the administration of the Rex Deus families. These Rex Deus families, who outwardly conformed to the religion of their time and place, secretly handed down an initiatory system based on the true teachings of Jesus. They tried to influence and change the church from within by taking positions of importance. A noble of Burgundy, Bernard de Fontaine, expressed a desire to become a monk in the new and struggling Cistercian order, much to the horror of his family. But suddenly the family's attitude changed and 32 of his friends and relatives became novices with Bernard in 1112. Historian Dom David Knowles described Bernard as a leader, writer, preacher with spiritual power, which was irrepressible. Men came from all over Europe to Clairvaux and were sent out all over the continent. Among his ex-monks were popes, Archbishop of Canterbury, cardinals, and bishops. In spite of never rising above the office of Abbot of Clairvaux, Bernard advised kings, popes, emperors, and nobility. He also played a significant role in the spiritual tradition of craft masons known as the Children of Solomon. Among his Rex Deus relatives were his cousin, who became Patriarch of Jerusalem, his uncle André de Montbard, Hugh de Payen, the St. Clairs, the Setons of Scotland, the Royal House of Flanders, and the most important noble in Europe, Count Hugh de Champagne. Hugh met with the Rex Deus families in a secret conclave in 1104. He then left for the Holy Land and did not return until 1108. In 1114, he made another mysterious trip to Jerusalem. On his return, he made a donation of land to the Cistercians, upon which they erected the Abbey of Clairvaux, and Bernard was appointed the first abbot. These are the events which led to the formation of the Poor Knights of Christ and the Temple of Solomon. The first Grand Master, Hugh de Payen, was a cousin of Bernard of Clairvaux. During the first eight or nine years of the Templars' existence, they largely neglected their avowed purpose of protecting pilgrims for the purpose of digging tunnels under the Temple Mount. Those tunnels were discovered in the early 20th century when Lieutenant Warren of the Royal Engineers, who explored them uh, and finding many Templar artifacts, when the Templars completed their excavations, Grand Master Hugh de Payen uh, asked King Baldwin to write to Bernard de Clairvaux, asking him to intercede with the Pope for formal recognition of the order. Bernard, being the principal advisor and former teacher of the Pope, the recognition was quickly granted. Nobles throughout Europe began giving lands and estates to the new Templar order. Well, due to the restraints of time, I will skip both the growth of the order, the Inquisition, and the dissolution of the Knights Templar, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. 
the more interesting story is that of its secret continuance. According to the Rex Deus family accounts, after the Scottish victory at uh, Bannockburn, as an act of gratitude and recognition, uh, King Robert the Bruce became the sovereign grand master of the Temp Templar order. As a pragmatist, the king knew that his country needed to live in the medieval world, uh, which meant making peace with the Pope, and that would require the Templars to go underground to ensure the survival of their traditions. The Templar properties in Scotland were given to the Knights Hospitallers, but they were accounted for, uh, accounted for separately as though being held in trust to be returned at a future time. So what were the beliefs and secret teachings of the Templars? One hint comes to us engraved on the stone walls of uh, massive cathedrals and churches. After the Templars made their discoveries, uh, digging under the Temple Mount at Jerusalem, suddenly we see the building of great churches in the Gothic style. There seems to be no transitional period between Romanesque and Gothic architecture. We see great buildings incorporating the sacred geometry of the uh, Egyptians' uh, architecture. We see buildings reaching greater heights than, than ever before. The persons we find at the center of all this new building is Bernard of Clairvaux and the Cistercian Order. At the center of this Gothic building was a fraternity of builders called the Children of Solomon. With the encouragement of Bernard de Clairvaux, the Knights nice Templar gave a rule to this fraternity in March of 1145. The true nature of the relationship between these two orders is impossible to directly establish, but at the suppression of the Templars, the Children of Solomon lost all privileges and immunities, which is an interesting coincidence. The great cathedral at Chartres uh, built by this fraternity, had no image of the crucifixion, a hint of the underlying heresy of the Gnostics. It is also considered to be an initiatory center and one of a number of churches featuring the Black Madonna, which has connections to the Knights nice Templar and links to the worship of Isis in ancient Egypt. Jumping forward to the 17th and 18th centuries, why did so many intellectuals join the Masonic fraternity in the Renaissance? Unlike the church, which attempted to limit and control access to knowledge, the fraternity operated in secrecy, not only to protect their trade secrets, but to protect their, uh, protect their moral and spiritual teachings as well. From where did these moral and spiritual teachings come? Did they come from ancient Egyptian priestly families? Did their traditions and teachings transmit to the Jews through their priestly families? During the diaspora, did the teachings transmit to the Jews, uh, or during the diaspora, did these priestly families spread throughout the world? Did these priestly families come uh, create the Knights Templar to preserve and propagate the secret knowledge? When the Knights were uh, suppressed, did they pass their knowledge to the children of Solomon. The story is much more complicated than I'm able to communicate in such a short time, but Tim Wallace Murphy does a superb job. His book, The Knights of the Holy Grail, The Secret History of the Knights Templar, uh, which you can get on Amazon, by the way, uh, he lays out the history in an easy to follow manner. He carefully documents his sources and it is uh, pleasant to read. The last 20% of his book is footnotes where you got all this information. So that, that's a, a very valuable resource. At the end of the book, he points out the fruits of initiation uh, in the treasured works of Freemasons, such as the poetry of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, uh, music of Mozart, uh, writings of John Sibelius, Rudyard Kipling, uh, Jonathan Swift, uh, who back, actually, <laughs> When you go to uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, uh, you'll see a lot about Jonathan Swift because he was the uh, dean of that cathedral. And, and that, by the way, is not a Roman Catholic cathedral, which most people think it is. It's a uh, Church of Ireland cathedral. Uh, and the music of W.S. Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan fame, uh, Duke Ellington, uh, just to name a few. In a world assailed by terrorism and wars, 
Freemasonry brings together men of every class, race, and creed, uniting Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists with the principles of truth and justice. Perhaps this is the ultimate result in the search for the Holy Grail. I highly recommend you go to uh, YouTube and uh, type in Tim Wallace-Murphy uh, and listen to some of him speaking uh, in many of his uh, lectures. Uh, his books are just absolutely amazing. It, it, it stuff that blew my mind. So highly recommend it. Uh, by the way, when he was publishing his first books, uh, he was contacted in France by uh, a person who claimed to be a member of the Ma Mado, uh, you know, in modern times. And he was very skeptical at first about it, but uh, which you can imagine. Uh, but he met with this guy and uh, he's, Tim Wallace Murphy was convinced this guy was the real thing and that the Mahmado families, uh, uh, which began in ancient Egypt, were still uh, active uh, in France and, and in other areas as well, but uh, uh, primarily in France. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, Don, that was fantastic. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a history that I think uh, most of us knew bits and pieces of it, but yeah. not, the, uh, not the full story like that. So it sounds like uh, Tim Wallace Murphy really put in his homework in that. He did, yeah. And, and he really put it all together into uh, something that uh, is uh, more meaningful for us today. It's interesting. I, I went over when I was Grand High Priest in Virginia uh, in 2015. I took 18 people over to Ireland and we toured around. And... Uh, I got a hold of a guy over there who sort of as a sideline does tours and he's a brother uh, as well. And uh, he, uh, he just did a wonderful job for us. He took us down uh, uh, Wicklow County is uh, south of Dublin and it goes clear down to the, uh, follows the coast and clear down to the Southern coast. Uh, and on the Southern coast, there's a little projection of land uh, called the hook, uh, and on the end of the hook uh, is a lighthouse that is the oldest operating lighthouse in the world. It was built by a Knight Templar. Uh, about a mile up the road from the hook is the ruins of a Cistercian Abbey, and the Cistercian monks uh, were the ones who operated the lighthouse and lived there. Uh, there's a little projection at the base of the uh, lighthouse that uh, was a, a chapel for the, the monks to use. So uh, here again is the Cistercians and the Knights Templar uh, crossing paths. Uh, they, were, they were basically one and the same, but uh, uh, it's uh, fascinating stuff. And he, he told me about Wallace Murphy and uh, I was so taken by what he had to say that I got online that night in Ireland uh, and ordered his book uh, by uh, uh, the uh, Kindle. Uh, I got the Kindle edition and started reading it that night and stayed up damn near all night reading because I just couldn't put it down. It was pretty amazing. So uh, highly recommend it. Well, let me ask you this. I think it's uh, very interesting to, to kind of tie the correlation to what the true meaning of the Holy Grail is. And it's more, uh, from our point of view, more alchemical. It's about uh, that that change from, you know, a, a base presence of like a base metal, base material uh, to something better, something uh, improved. And that is in a way that Holy Grail. So I think you're right. I think we as Masons do really carry on that legacy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in Wallace Murphy's research, did he, did he uncover anything regarding the Sufi connection with masonry? Oh, yeah. In fact, he goes into uh, some of that. Uh, of course, the Knights Templar uh, over in uh, uh, the Middle East uh, had, they, they were very accepting of all religions. Uh, they saw, as the Mahmado taught, they saw this as being a universal kind of thing, and they, they respected them. And, and I think because of that respect, uh, the uh, uh, Saracens over there were uh, uh, more amenable to the Knights Templar than to any any other orders. Uh, the Knights Templar wouldn't uh, kill you for your beliefs. Uh, they 
generally were a little better than that. But the bottom line is the uh, the Saracens uh, never would go in and just totally wipe out an entire population. Uh, it was the Christians who did that. <laughs> and nice. accounts of blood running up beyond people's ankles uh, in, in battles that they killed so many people, men, women, and children. Uh, and the Saracens didn't do that. So. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the really around the Albigensian or Albigensian crusade in, in that, that time in Southern France, Right, I believe that's the time that the uh, the Catholic Church began to lose favor with the Knights Templar because the Templars would not round up the Cathars, which Absolutely. was the purpose of that crusade. That was the only crusade that was ever conducted in a Christian Western country, and uh, they were peaceful people, very peaceful people, but uh, they clung to their beliefs and. Basically, the church at that time is you either believe what we tell you to believe or we'll kill you. And they did. They wiped out uh, the last vestige there. That was uh, uh, pretty amazing. It is. The truth is those Gnostic ideas have persisted. We don't have Cathars as such, but uh, the, the Gnostic ideas and philosophies have just continued, really. I guess me is if you, if you read a history on the uh, Council of Nicaea. Uh, that's what made me start to take a second look at uh, uh, modern Christianity and, and uh, uh, the traditions, uh, because none of this has anything to do with what Jesus taught. Uh, the uh, Nicene Creed was basically, like I said before, uh, uh, the uh, emperor uh, Constantine could care less what they believed. He just wanted the bickering and fighting to stop, and they all believed the same thing. Well, the winner, if you read the history, the winners of that battle at Nicaea were uh, what we see now, uh, and the Gnostics, who claimed to have a secret tradition, secret teachings of Jesus that it took years to be able to uh, be able to comprehend uh, through a, a, a system of uh, initiation, um, they totally suppressed it. And those who clung to that belief were totally uh, either killed or uh, exiled. And uh, the we have no idea really what the uh, teachings of the Gnostics were except for the writings that we found uh, at Nag Hammadi, the, the Gospels that were suppressed and rejected. And also, at, <laughs> uh, there was a, a, a Scottish uh, explorer who found a, and this was in Europe, he found a uh, well, he actually, his first excursion was down to Ethiopia, and he found a book uh, of Enoch, and nobody accepted this. This was in the 18th century. Nobody accepted this book. Uh, they told him it was a bunch of crap. Uh, here's the story of Enoch and his travels and being taken into heaven and this, that, and the other. Well, it turned out that probably 50 or so years, maybe 100 years after that, uh, they found another copy of this book in Eastern Europe. And once it was uh, translated, it uh, was almost verbatim the same as the one in Ethiopia. So now scholars are scratching their heads going, well, maybe this is legit. But uh, when they found the... Uh, uh, Scrolls at Qumran, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, there were several copies of the Book of Enoch there. And so that proved that this Book of Enoch was actually a, a biblical book that was uh, uh, widely used at the time of Jesus. So Jesus would have been very uh, familiar with that. And of course, uh, Enoch figures, uh, he's the great grandfather of Noah. He figures very big in our, a lot of our Masonic work. So uh, that's a very interesting thing as well. But that it was totally suppressed by the church. So. Worship brother Mark Toon from Lodge Pythagoras in Alberta has asked, were the Cathars and Knights Templar the last of the Gnostic tradition? 
I would say they probably were. Now, we don't really know. We probably know more about the Cathars than we do about the teachings of the Knights Templar. Uh, that, that's, they kept that pretty darn secret, so uh, it's hard to tell. But uh, certainly the uh, Knights Templar, uh, if not protective of, were not willing to condemn the Cathars. And uh, uh, that, that was uh, the only time that a uh, crusade took place in a Christian country. I think as far as uh, outward religion, I think uh, the Cathars may have been the last of the, the Gnostics. I mean, of course, you had the Bogomils prior to that, and you had a, a succession of these uh, Gnostic orders. But I think uh, a lot of the Gnostic philosophies and things like that have persisted in different initiatic orders. Um, also, uh, you know, it's... Um, you know, if you look at the uh, Coptic Christians in Egypt, right? You know, there yeah, there were ones who uh, didn't follow the uh, uh, Nicene tradition. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, so I think I think a lot of it 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 may be a diluted version of what the Cathars or Bogomils or or those really believe. But I think uh, a lot of their basic philosophies have, have carried through, and I think um, I can't help but believe that that has influenced the Templars in a way. And, uh, you know, possibly found its way into masonry as well. Well, yeah, I think uh, masonry, uh, there are a lot of people who speculate that masonry derived originally from traditions in ancient Egypt. Uh, there seems to be connections there. And certainly this book goes into that connection through the, the uh, royal families of Egypt. Uh, there, uh, this Ralph Ellis uh, an English author. I recommend him highly. Uh, in fact, I do a, a, a program uh, on five books that he wrote. They're all related. Uh, but basically, he uh, shows how uh, the ancient Egyptian influence and how that developed and, and traveled out of Egypt. And a uh, very, very fascinating piece of work that he did. Uh, and Ralph Ellis, I think, is another one you can uh, find who uh, does some of his lectures on uh, YouTube, and in fact, he has his own YouTube channel. Uh, he's he lives in England, and he is a brother. Uh, but it's uh, very very fascinating to see uh, back in you know the Hiram Key uh, uh, that was uh, also suggesting that our Masonic traditions uh, originated in Egypt, and and we are sort of uh, recipients of that from uh, uh, a time long ago. So. Yeah, the Hiram Key was definitely an interesting book. I think they made a lot of leaps there. Oh, um, they, they did, yeah. But it still, nonetheless, if you, you can kind of weed through it. There are some really interesting facts in there that, that really do make you scratch your head and say, no, right. there's something here. Well, you know, uh, one of them, I can't remember which of the authors uh, it was, but he, he was uh, over in, uh, let me see, uh, Wales. He was in Wales with his son and doing some research. And there are what they call these passage tombs. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, these passage tombs all are astronomically aligned. And uh, he and his son were waiting for the sunrise on a particular solstice or equinox. I think it was a solstice, winter solstice. Uh, but it was really cold out and they were freezing their butts off. <laughs> so they decided to go back into the passage tomb, which is about 150 feet passage deep. Uh, and uh, they were waiting for the, uh, the sun to come up to see where it struck at the back of the tomb was uh, a uh, target uh, Stella. Uh, and they figured the sun, he figured the sun had to either, uh, line up on the middle or the top or maybe even the bottom of the Stella. Uh, that, and that was the purpose of it was to measure the sunrise. And uh, all of a sudden, the uh, there was a light. It wasn't the sun, but there was a light that illuminated this. And it uh, uh, they couldn't figure out what this light was. It was pretty bright. And... Uh, they went outside to look and it was Venus. And it was the, I think every five years, Venus rises just before sunrise. 
rises right over the sun just before sunrise and it, venus is at its brightest point in those five in that five year cycle and uh they went out and looked and when he saw what it was he had to start doing some research on that uh and then of course the sun came up later uh illuminating uh as well but uh, uh it was where the sun the sun didn't uh didn't shine on a particular, there's a stone at the entrance. So there's only a little line across the top of the stone where the sun would illuminate the, uh, the target Stella. And uh, it didn't, it, it, the sun didn't hit it at a place that he would figure it should. Uh, so it was obviously built for the express purpose of tracking the sunrise or the rise of Venus. And uh, that's an eight year cycle. And for them to be able to track Venus and know that it was an eight-year cycle uh, that did that uh, was pretty amazing. Uh, so that that was a subject of uh, of his book, but uh, uh, very interesting stuff. But it, again, it goes all the way back to uh, uh, to ancient Egypt. Oh, wow, that's incredible! Do any brothers have any questions for Worship Brother Don? Yes, I've, I've got a few. Sorry, Onigo. After you. Go ahead, Stephen. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, that, that was just an exciting presentation. Thanks very much, Brother Don. Um, I was just speaking to Brother Lomas this evening, actually, um, the, the <laughs> early evening. He's the author of The Hiram Key. Um, he gave a, a fantastic lecture in the Grand Lodge of Lebanon this afternoon. Um, I, I was going to bring you back to Ralph er, er, Ellis. You actually answered one of the questions for me. I, I was going to ask, is he a brother? And um, But I'm quite fascinated with his work. Um, I came across it a few years ago, and uh, I've got a few books of his. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on his uh, work on Cleopatra to Christ. Um, Very interesting stuff. Uh, yes, and 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 basically, his premise is that Jesus uh, mm -hmm. was a pharaoh of Lower Egypt. Yes, and 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 Cleopatra having two children. One. The, the one amazing that, thing was, why did the uh, Holy Family uh, go to Egypt mm -hmm. when uh, all the uh, Holy Innocents were slaughtered? Well, you look at the Holy Innocents. And there's absolutely no record in any history of Herod killing uh, hundreds of male children. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it didn't happen. Uh, he, he basically figures uh, that it was a cover story because the Jews really want to distance themselves from being identified with Egypt or deriving from Egypt. They want to be unique in their own right. And, this was a cover story because Jesus was actually going to Heliopolis to be mm -hmm. trained to be Pharaoh of Lower Egypt. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so it yes. was a royal family. And if you look at the uh, Gospels, you'll see two different accounts of the royal lineage. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is through Mary and the other is through Joseph. So this whole idea of virgin birth and all that is... Yes, I, I find it really fascinating. And, and on, can I help? Can I have your thoughts on, um, okay, um, Cleopatra married Caesar, had a child, married Anthony, Mark Anthony, yeah. had a child, um, allegedly. One was given to Morocco, the other one was passed on to, was it the, somewhere in the eastern Syria, I believe? Yeah, I, I don't recall. I, well, I, I, I kind of remember this story, and, and she married uh, the, the ruler of that area and had a child. The, the ruler died, and she had a child with... Uh, she had a child with that son, and they get kicked out of those lands and settled in Odessa, and he became the king of Odessa. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, mm. it's interesting, too, in that story of the Holy Family Fascinating. In, yes. in Egypt. Uh, mm. We have no history of Jesus' early childhood, yes. none whatsoever, mm. because he wasn't around. He was down in Egypt mm. being trained. So, uh, it, it, so 
bits. Are you in, sorry? Are you inclined to follow that narrative then? There's a lot of research states that that might be a line of inquiry that's very plausible. Yeah, I I think that's a, a, a very possible mm -hmm. history. That's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Where are you located, Stephen? Uh, I'm in the Highlands of Scotland. I, oh, in, okay. uh, I live in a small village in Sutherland, which is in... in well, the there's Highlands. an interesting author over in Ireland who uh, I was supposed to spend some time with at his home uh, uh, this earlier this year, but that didn't work out. Uh, but he's, he's written a, a book, uh, a couple of books, but uh, one very interesting book about uh, uh, St. Columba. Yeah. And... Sure. Columba is on, second only to St. Patrick mm -hmm. in veneration in uh, Ireland. And he, Chris McClintock uh, basically claims that he was the last Druid. That's correct, yes. <laughs> and, and there is a yes. whole place up in the very northwest uh, coast of Ireland where they have a, uh, a pilgrimage route uh, mm -hmm. uh, basically marked with crosses. And on his uh, birthday, uh, pilgrims come and walk this route. But one of the crosses uh, is not oriented as all of the other crosses are. And it so, has a hole drilled right through the transept. Yes. And it, uh, looking through the hole, you can see this uh, cliff called the head. Uh, and it's in a place called Glen Colum Kill. Now, right. Colum yeah. is the Gaelic for uh, uh, Columba. Uh, and Glen, you know what a Glen is, uh, yes. and Kill means church. So it was the uh, Glen of uh, uh, Columbus Church. And looking through this, uh, there are two square outcroppings of stone. I mean, perfectly square outcroppings and look obviously to be man-made. Uh, one of them is on the uh, summer solstice. The sun will set right smack on that. And the larger one, which uh, Chris originally thought was going to be the solstice was on Columbus' birthday. <laughs> so it was yes. like, wow. <laughs> yes, I, I think the exact translation of, of that church in, in Ireland is the Valley of the Church of Columbus. Right. Um, rather than the Glen, you know, the, the valleys as in meeting points. Yeah. The Valley of the Church of Columbus. Yes, and, and just one one last question as well. This is something I didn't realize. You said that the, the families of Jesus were in the Middle East and maintained control or doctrine until the second century. Well, you, you uh, said yes. The, the it wasn't necessarily the families of Jesus, but the ah, families okay. of Jesus was associated with. Okay, uh, yes. It was the Mahmado, which uh, uh, originally came from uh, uh, Egypt. But if you read some of, uh, 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 I'm blanking. God, you know, being old is hell. Uh, I didn't think it would take this long to get old. <laughs> it must hurt. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, oh, crap. The, the English author, uh, too. And I just mentioned his name, too. Well, anyway, he, uh, he claims that these uh, families, uh, which... Uh, eventually found their uh, largest congregation of members was down in France. So, uh, but that they, they were descendants of the people. Now, it's, when I visited Qumran over in, in uh, uh, the Holy Land, uh, Qumran, I, I got a book there. Uh, we didn't have too much time on the site, but I got a book. And the book explained that the... Uh, the people there were Zedekites. Now, that suddenly rung a bell because mm -hmm. of our Masonic tradition. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, the cryptic council does a chair degree, which is right out of the Bible, right out of Kings, uh, and it's about the transition of power from Solomon uh, to uh, his son. Uh, or it's not Solomon, uh, David to his son Solomon. And uh, uh, the whole thing uh, is very much uh, of this tradition, uh, the, the things that went on. It, uh, you can read it for yourself. Uh, 
if you're a cryptic mason, it's the uh, uh, the chair degree. If uh, you read it in the Bible, it's uh, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, story of the passing of power. But uh, that relates directly back to all of this stuff. And it's in our Masonic ritual. So that, that's what stuns me. And, and can I ask just one last question as sure. well? And um, with with these these families or or um, tracings of families uh, that, that ruled in this, until the second century, or and how did where does that tie in with the the, the Botas family or the families going to landing in Marie Sumer, Sumer in the south of France? You, you, we have a story of, of a tradition being built from that, that coastal landing in France. And, and then, you're, then you've got another story of, of these families up until the sec second century. Did they unite in Europe or? Well, if you, if you look at the traditions of Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. they say that she uh, actually went uh, by boat uh, yes. to Southern France. To Marie uh, Sula Mary, yes. Also Pontius Pilate, uh, when he retired from his uh, job, he uh, had a huge tract of land in southern France. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so yeah. there's a definite connection there mm -hmm. that uh, uh, nobody's really explored all that well, but uh, it's uh, uh, sort of fascinating. It's fascinating. Thanks very much for answering those questions. Well, it's like two o'clock in the morning where you are, isn't it? It's uh, quarter past two, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. but it's, it's such a delight. and um, mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks very much. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, if you're answer. ever in Virginia, look me up, man. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I will pick your brains all night. Well, you know, sure. Columba ended up in uh, in Scotland. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes, of course, to, yes. I own it. So, yeah. Yes, he, he, he came up he, he came up the, the, the west coast, uh, or the east coast, sorry, and, and came in and, and went down uh, Loch Ness. Um, it was Columba who famously had the first sighting of the Loch Ness monster. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's that's how the the, the general public hear <laughs> of Christopher Columbus and his claims because he was the first to sight Nessie. Yeah. And um, yes, but he, he went right down the Great Natural Fall. It's the Great Glen. It's, it's a huge natural fall from one end of Scotland, and in the bottom half takes you out just opposite yeah. there, you know. Well, Chris McClintock did some uh, uh, astronomical research and discovered there is a narrow band of land around the entire earth that passes through uh, where he uh, found this Columba uh, pilgrimage route uh, up in uh, Northwest Ireland in Donegal, uh, yes. through Belfast mm -hmm. and clear over through uh, uh, where Rosalind Chapel is. And this band is the only place on the earth where uh, the solstices uh, form a right angle, sh a shadow at a perfect 90 degree angle. Really? Do you have any information on that? I can. Yeah, no, I get uh, Chris Mc. Well, he, damn, you know, you can't get Chris McClintock's book. I did uh, at the Esoter Esotericon this, uh, this year, I did a, 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 a paper on Chris McClintock and his book, uh, the uh, Chris, I tried to contact saying, where can we get this? The, Lodge of Research of Ireland um, had it on their website, and I went to the website to see if you could order it there. Uh, yeah, they've changed the whole website, and no nothing is there. Uh, Bob Bashford, who uh, was is the secretary of the Lodge of Research, uh, I finally got a hold of him and said, uh, how do you get this book? And he said, it's out of print. And <laughs> do you have the title of the book? But uh, I finally got a hold of Chris and I said, you know, hey, look, guy, if if you want to publish and make this available to people, you can do that at, at Amazon for no cost to you. Uh, and they publish on demand and they just send you a cut of the the, the money and uh, you, you don't have to do anything for it. Uh, but for whatever reason, his business is uh, making stained glass windows and he's a very odd kind of guy but uh, unfortunately he just uh, was not all that interested but uh, you have the title of this book sorry uh, it is shoot hold on just a second and i'll stop asking out no no else that's question. ask questions that's how we all learn don uh worship brother ben wallace just uh posted on the facebook chat that you can order his books directly from him 
Uh, yeah, you used to be able to, but he said he didn't have any. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. He said he's completely out and, uh, uh, and he, he didn't have the money uh, to buy more. So, uh, and I even offered to fund him some money. Just, I, I tried to get this done bef before the Esotericon, uh, but uh, it didn't, didn't pan out. So uh, hold on just a second. Well, Let me see. Yeah, Ben Wallace is saying yes. Uh, the book is The Craft and the Cross. The Craft and the Cross. There you go. Yep. I've heard of, yes, I've heard of that book. Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's, it is an outstanding book. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now, yeah, one warning, a disclaimer. Chris is a very intelligent guy. He's done probably close to 20 years of research on this. Uh, but Chris is a very, uh, very intelligent, but he rambles. So it's not a nice story going along. It's uh, this, that, and the other. But when you get done with it, you're just shaking your head going, wow. <laughs> so... Uh, He's, Sounds like my kind of big. Well, he, he even, uh, because of all of this, uh, uh, the square of the sun, uh, or he calls it the cross of the sun, uh, or the sun, uh, S-U-N, of God, uh, he, uh, he goes through all this uh, astronomy, and he got some software for his computer that he could uh, uh, verify all this. In fact, in the Irish ritual, I don't know if this is true in Scotland or not, but in the Irish ris ritual, when a uh, candidate is raised, uh, they put him into a uh, position with his hands raised uh, and his right leg crossed across the knee of his left. And this happens to be, uh, if you look at the constellation of Orion, uh, it, that's the shape. Uh, so, and Orion, when he, when Orion comes up in the, uh, Eastern sky at night, he is reposed, reclining. When he sets in the West, he is vertical. He's standing. So he's raised, <laughs> which is, uh, Chris figured that out, uh, basically by his, uh, uh, astronomy software. And, uh, that's an amazing connection again, back to uh, more ancient times. So. Wow. That, that is incredible. Uh, Worshipful brother Mark Toon does have a question. Uh, he says, uh, let's scroll back up to it. It's jumping on me. Uh, do we have evidence that the Knights Templar had a three degree system of initiation? No, we have no evidence of what the hell they did. I've heard rumor of that, but I've never heard, I've never seen actually solid. Uh, yeah, no, there's, there's no, nothing that's come down to us uh, that basically confirms what they did, what they taught. There's all kinds of legends, but uh, uh, we have nothing. So it's, it's unfortunate. And then he had one other question. He says, was not Mary the black Madonna? Uh, I assume he's referring to well, Mary Magdalene. Actually, if you research the Black Madonna, it really goes back to ancient Egypt and to uh, uh, Isis. Isis is the Black Madonna. So that, that's very interesting. And uh, Osiris, by the way, uh, is uh, Orion in the sky. Uh, Orion is the ascended uh, 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 I'm blanking again. Uh, Osiris is is uh, the the constellation is the ascended Osiris. So that's that's what the Egyptians taught and and believed, and uh, so that very fascinating. Again, the Egyptian connection. So so we'll just uh, we'll see if does anyone else have a question. I see Brother Ron. Go right ahead. Ron, how you doing? Glad you made it. Good. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, actually, you had mentioned this book uh, probably about six months ago in Scottish Rite. Yes, right. Uh, and I, I actually bought it during the meeting uh, while we were sitting there, and I, I, I really enjoyed this book. This was my first kind of uh, experience with this, because as you know, I'm a newer Mason, newish. You actually did one of my, I think you did the lecture for my EA degree four years ago. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I did have a question though. Uh, so reading like uh, Art Arturo de Hoyos and all this stuff, like they seem to not agree with this type of uh, 
this line of thinking at all. That's what yeah. I'm, the impression I'm getting. Art, art is a, a very uh, highly respected scholar, and he just doesn't accept anything that there's not some hard literal proof of. And what I'm seeing is so many of the authors connecting back to ancient Egypt, uh, there's just too many things that lead back there. Uh, uh, as thin as they may be, they all are going to the same place. So you've got to believe there's something going on there. Uh, it may not be exactly as each of the authors has researched and come up with. Uh, Wallace Murphy, his research is impeccable, but again, he's uh, making some assumptions and a lot of people are just not willing to make those assumptions or make those steps of faith. And, and if uh, I remember correctly, he does say that in the book, like there's no hard evidence. I mean, he's, right. he has to fill in some gaps. Uh, right. Yeah, exactly. So I believe he admit, admits that. Well, uh, Ralph Ellis does the same thing. Ralph Ellis has some very interesting uh, uh, ideas, uh, but uh, yeah, he is very upfront about the fact that there's a whole lot of stuff that points there, but uh, you can't say for absolutely sure. Ellis, uh, he actually educated, he's not a professional uh, scholar. He educated himself in the Egyptian language. And it's amazing in his books, how many uh, uh, Hebrew words are pronounced identical or almost identical to the Egyptian words. And uh, he also put together the uh, thought that uh, uh, depending on how a scribe uh, transcribes uh, kingly names, uh, they can be pronounced more than one way. And the pharaohs in Egypt uh, had their royal name, they had their family name, and then they had what he calls more of a nickname, what, what they were called uh, by their own family. And uh, uh, Abraham, supposedly the first Jew, uh, who actually went down to Egypt at one point, uh, Abraham was, uh, there was a pharaoh uh, whose nickname was Abramem. So he, Ellis says that all of the early patriarchs of, of Israel were actually pharaohs of lower Egypt, which is the Nile Delta. Uh, and the Nile Delta is a couple hour walk from uh, uh, Gaza. So, I mean, it's, it's right there. Yeah, so that, there may be some truth to that. Yeah, I believe uh, M, uh, M. Hotep's nickname was Bubba. Yeah. <laughs> but, you, you know, you, you bring Maybe up... from a, North Carolina. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, <laughs> but you bring up a fascinating point. You know, there's a lot of scholars out there that say that there's no link between the Knights Templar and Masonry. There's no link between the ancient Egyptians and, and Masonry or any other order or things like that. But we have, a, we have a history where there were a lot of things that were very secretive. They were not written down. We, we're right. not going to find a tablet. We're not going to find a papyrus that tells us this is it. And that's what they're looking for is that smoking gun. Right. Uh, they're looking for, you know, the Templars didn't keep records because they were so secretive. And their, their teaching was mouth to ear just like masonry is. It was. But it, it's not a, a far leap to connect those things. If you just connect the dots, there are these little... Uh, synchronicities that right. occur. And it's almost like some of those are too much to be a coincidence. Right. Yeah, too many of them. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. You got a question, Tim? Yeah, well, just to kind of add to what you and Matt were just saying, it w modern Western thought dictates that historians and art and researchers during our time period will expect their research to be as clean as a crime scene investigation <laughs> as, if, as if you know they they have to prosecute someone in court they have to connect they have to have these lodge minutes and records or whatever that say x y and z along with the treasurer's records and when you're dealing with people who are purposely veiling things because they were in a secret society that could get them persecuted, you know, or sent to death for, for some of these beliefs, you know, that they purposely hid things. And so researchers today, they have to 
you, you can't look at it as if you're an arson investigator, but rather as you're a fireman looking for a fire. And if you see smoke, there's a fire. And, you know, if you also think of it like a suspension bridge, you know, the, the steps are not like a, a bridge you drive across, but they're a couple feet apart. And so if, if you can find these dots, you don't necessarily have to connect them, but if you're able to walk across them and find solid ground at some point, then, you know, you've, you've, you've done research of, of some kind. You, uh, you might want to document kind of those steps, but, um, yeah, you'll find modern historians, um, people like Art de Hoyo, who are very high profile. You know, I'm sure they receive tons of criticism from academics, and for their the ben giving them the benefit of you know brotherly love and support, they are trying their best to to publish things that make Masonic research be credible to our community and to, and so, you know, Lord bless them for, for that work that they do. I personally, I'm glad I don't have that, that, uh, responsibility on my shoulder and I can follow the smoke and, you know, pursue things that interest me. Um, you have to, you have to, I guess every Mason's got to chase their own light, but that that's, that's my two cents. Um, but two more things I want to add, just because I like to hear myself talk. Uh, when I when I became a Mason, I read those uh, Knight and Lomas books, right? Like a like a young boy reading GI Joe comic books. I read those things just cover to cover, multiple times, and those things were so much fun. I would love to see Brother Lomas come on. Uh, refracted light or in North Carolina Masonic Research Society and do a presentation to talk about their work. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see Ralph Ellis do some lectures yeah. uh, over in this country. That, that would be great. Someone else who is a, a person worth researching from history was uh, Raymond Lowell. Um, he was an interesting person, but he might be one of those bridges between the Knight Templars and modern masonry. He lived from 1232 to 1315. Um, and he was a Roman Catholic bishop, mathematician, philosopher, mystic. And at times the church, the Roman Catholic church has tried to have him charged with heresy and also tried to have him uh, honored for sainthood. But he was an alchemist and, and may or may not have written several books that the Roman Catholic Church tried to say he didn't write. Um, he was also the, the person, and if you think about this, there was no notion that Jesus's mother was conceived by divine or immaculate conception. He was the one who came up with that idea in 1230 or at, during his lifetime and, and they published it. Um, he was also the first one, the first, uh, person who convinced the church that maybe beheading or conversion was not the best conversion or evangelical method. And, and he, he developed a system of math, philosophy, and art to try to use as a, as a missionary method, um, but he, he did a lot of work based on, um, I, I believe that he was influenced heavily by some of the Templars philosophy and some of those, uh, their internal philosophies, not their combative strategies, but um, yeah, he, he was someone else that I think is definitely worth researching. N not necessarily for purely Masonic research, but in the spirit of, of some of the messages that Freemasonry conveys and carries. And I believe is a steward of, but those were more comments and questions. Oh, some great comments, Tim. I think it's 
certainly something something to research further and look into. I think that's uh, very great observations. So we'll do one last round. Does anyone else have any questions? I see, uh, Stephen, you, your uh, internet came back up. So glad you could rejoin us. Yes, I had to uh, go online and restart it through the software. I don't know what happened there. Sorry, it just dropped out. Um, I, I missed what um, Timothy was saying. I'm sure it was excellent. Well, we want you to get Brother Lomas to come speak for us. Okay. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I, I sent him an email anyway, so I, I can maybe send him another one. I'm not a great friend of his or, or anything. It's, I was just speaking him to tonight. He'd he done a fantastic presentation of the... the Grand Lodge webinar about the myths of Freemasonry. It was fantastic. All right, well, brother, but I'll try. Yeah, I, I would love that, Stephen. If you could, uh, if you could, um, you know, give uh, uh, brother Lomas my uh, email address. If you can get us in touch, I'd love to talk with him and, and maybe set up a time for him to come speak to us. Yes, definitely. Is this live still? Is it okay? Um, I'm not making any promises, to be honest, but I'll, okay. I'll mention it to him and I'll pass it on, your email on to him, and hopefully we'll be in touch with you soon. Well, I, I appreciate that. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and stop the live feed now. I appreciate everybody showing up tonight. I uh, appreciate everybody watching on Facebook and uh, hope you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have. And we will see you next week.